and welcome to the ArcGIS API for JavaScript, Building Apps with React. My name is Tom Wason. I'm joined today by my esteemed colleague, Rene Ruwakaba, and we're going to tell you how to get the ArcGIS API into your React applications. The good news is this is easier than ever. If you've been following along throughout the years, there's been a few hoops you may have had to jump through here and there, but as of the latest release, 418, I would say, you know, it just works. Um, or at least it works as well as integrating, you know, like mapping or charting and like dynamically fetching data asynchronously and, you know, waiting for React to render some DOM so they can use WebGL to draw into and all that sort of stuff. Like many of those libraries, we have uh, some off the shelf, ready to use components you can use to just drop into your React app and get going right away. This is the easiest way to get started. Uh, the library is called React ArcGIS, and it's just got a very bare bones set of, of components for you to work with maps and scenes. The easiest one to understand is web map. Pass in a string representing the item ID, and it renders out the web map right there. Same thing for a web scene, just pass in the item ID. If you're not working with items for Arc from ArcGIS Online, you can also use the map or scene components, and for these, instead of passing in an ID, you pass in the map and view props, just as POJOs. As I said, it's a very limited set of components. The library does have some instructions on how you can expand and create your own components. For example, here is a component that uh, adds a graphic representing the Bermuda Triangle to your view. And before you dive into those instructions, though, what I wanted to talk about today was some general concepts about creating components and work from those general concepts into the nitty-gritty of the code so you have a better understanding of what, uh, how to go about it. Stepping outside of React entirely, you know, when you're creating a map view with ArcGIS, you need three things. You need the container, which is usually an empty div. You need the map properties, like a base map, and you need the view properties, like your initial zoom, that sort of thing. These last two you could also use, instead of, of these properties directly, you could use an item ID and fetch those same properties from ArcGIS Online. And there's two steps, right? You are gonna have some HTML that renders out that, that div, and then later on in JavaScript, you're gonna create a new instance of a map, a new instance of map view, and then the view, you're gonna pass that div as a container using, typically if you're not using a framework, something like document get element by ID. We're going to do these same two steps in React, but in React it is components that are responsible for rendering DOM. So we're going to need a component that's going to render that container node. And then after that node is rendered, we're going to, the, we're going to need some, some time to create the map and view. And in React, and generally speaking, this is called a side effect. There's a, a bunch of uh, component concepts that we're going to be touching on today, and really I recommend before you start writing your own components that you become familiar with these concepts in React if you're not already. Also, in this talk, you've probably heard that there are two paradigms for authoring React components. You can either use ES6 classes, or you can use a set of APIs that React calls hooks. And in this talk, we're going to be showing hooks entirely. Um, if you need to see class-based examples, here's a link to our talk from last year, which shows a little bit of both. So, let's get into writing some code. The first step, rendering that container. In React, a component can be as simple as a function that returns some JSX. And in this case, we want to return that container, so we just this could be all we need to render the container. Is, but there is a problem with it, and that is that it's just generally an anti-pattern to uh, have your components render IDs. And again, this isn't a React thing, this is with working with any framework. Components are reusable, and you could theoretically have two of them on the same page, then you'd have two elements with the same ID. So instead, what React recommends that you do is uh, it provides a concept called refs, and these are how you get a reference to that DOM node. Um, there's a hook called useRef, and you call that at the beginning of your component, and it provides, you'll get a, uh, a variable called map, that we call map ref in, ref in this case, and then we can assign that to the div by using the ref 
attribute in the JSX. Now we'll be able to use this map ref variable later in our own code when we need to pass the container to the view. Now, we need to take, as we said, a side effect. In a side effect, we need to render the map and the view. Now, React has a, another hook API called useEffect for when you need to, to perform some action as a side effect. And this is a function that takes two arguments. And the way to think about these two arguments is the first one is a function, and it represents what you want to do. And the second is an array, and it represents when you want to do it. People get tripped up on this second argument, so we'll be paying special attention to it as we go along. But in this case, we know what we want to do. We want to render, we want to create a map and view. And so we just take that code that we showed earlier and copy it over inside that first argument, the function of the first argument. And really, there's nothing different than this other than instead of using document get element ID for the container, we're just using mapref.current to represent the current value of that mapref. And so that's it. That's, that's all we need to do to create a map and view. Um, in terms of when do we want to have this happen for that second argument? Well, we know we want to have it happen after the div has been rendered. And specifically, we want to have it happen the first time this component has rendered, and, and only the first time this component has rendered. And to do that, we pass in an empty array here. And again, this will make more sense later as we explain as we talk about this second argument. So for now, just know that whenever you're using an effect to create a map review, you probably want to pass in an empty array as the second argument. So here's the entire code for this map view component. Um, I've moved that code that creates the map and view out to a util function. There's no React in that code, uh, so it doesn't make any sense to have it here inside the component. Um, that function we're just, just takes a DOM node as the first argument, and so that's where we're going to pass in the map ref current. Um, and then there's one other thing that we've added here, and that is that our effect returns a function. And this is how you tell React um, what needs to be cleaned up. Usually in a side effect, you're creating something, in this case, a map view. And it's best practice to uh, destroy the things you create so that you don't have any memory leaks. So in this case, we're going to return a function that dis calls destroy on the view. So this is great. We've created a fully functioning map component following all the best practices. It's just not very useful. It's going to draw the same map every time it's used. It would be much more useful if we could pass in some properties to this that uh, we could use to draw different maps with the component. So like the base map or the zoom level. Um, so this is very easy to do. Some very minor changes uh, to our previous component. The in React, props are passed in as the first argument to the function. So here, all we care about is the base map and zoom. And we're going to use those to build up map properties and view properties. And then we are going to just have to modify that util function to take those in as additional arguments. Here we've got them, you know, we're passing them after we the, the map ref. And it would use what's passed in instead of just hard coded values. That's it. That's the only difference here. So now our, our component has become much more useful, but what if we wanted to update the map or update the view when those properties change? For example, imagine that underneath the map we've got a drop down, and when someone with all the different base maps that someone could have, and when they change the drop down, the map is updated. Well, whenever anything changes over time in React, we need to use React state. And again, there's a hook for this. It's called use state. It's a function that for, takes the initial value of what you want to use for that state, and it returns an array. And the first element of that array is the variable that you can use to reference the current value of state. And the second is a function that you can use to update the state. So in the parent component of our map container, we're going to hold on to the state of the currently selected base map. And so we'll call it use state at the beginning of it, and we'll pass that value into the map view and into our base map select component. And then the base map select component is going to call set base map 
when a user has changed the value that that they you know when they want to see a different base map. So the question is, how does our map view respond to that change? So when our parent passes a new value for base map in there, how does it respond? Well, we're going to use another effect. And again, think of this as what you want to have happen and when you want to have happen. What we want to have happen is we want to update the base map of the views map. And when we want to have it happen is whenever the base map property is changed. And this is this is where we start to understand why that second argument to use effect is an array. You're passing an array of all the values you want React to watch. And whenever any one of them changes, it's going to rerun your uh, effect. This is why we pass an empty array when we want to create a map because we only want that to happen when the component is first created. We don't want it to happen when any of the other props change. There's one problem with this effect though and that's that view will be undefined here when we try to set the base map. And that's because if you remember our the other effect that we had, we defined view as a local variable there. The way that I deal with this is I hold on to the view in state in my map component. So like the first line of my map component would be, you know, to use state and define a, uh, a, a variable for view that I can use throughout my map component. And then later in that first effect, instead of assigning the, the view to a local variable there, I'll just call set view and assign it to the, the view that's in state. And now we can use this view throughout and in our other effect, the view won't be undefined. There is one problem though, it could be null, right? Because here we're initializing that state to null. And what if that other effect is called before the effect that sets the view? There's no guarantee in the order in which these are called. So we got to do one other thing here. We got to put a guard in there to make sure we don't try to set the base map on a view that doesn't exist. And then finally, we add the view to the list of um, values that we want to watch for this. The general rule of thumb, if you use a value inside your effect, it should be inside, you should have it inside of your uh, array of dependencies there. So now we've got a map that can respond to changes in React state. This is much more useful to us. There's one last thing. What if we want to update React in response to changes in the view? And we can do this by you know, for example, if when the zoom changes on the view or if the user clicks on a view, we want to tell React about that. Well, you can pass in callbacks to a component the same way you would pass in other props. You know, in previously we were passing a base map of the string. Well, here we're going to pass in a, a on, on click callback uh, as a function. And we'll use yet another effect to wire up the callback as the event handler for this callback. This looks just like our base map one, only instead of setting a property on the view, we're going to call view on click and pass in the callback. And the only other difference is that we are taking advantage of that cleanup function to uh, remove the handler once either the view has been destroyed or when this component's being destroyed. And we're just going to, again, a best practice to prevent memory leaks. So you can see that components are a critical bridge between your React app and the ArcGIS API. And you've sh we've shown you how to you know, have sort of two-way communication across that bridge. Now we're going to zoom out from the component level to the sort of app level. Renee is going to talk about some React concepts and patterns that you can find useful there. Hey, thanks, Tom. So I want to talk a little bit about using the ArcGIS API for JavaScript uh, with React and specifically um, uh, ESM, uh, which was just recently been released as well. For the JavaScript API. So how do you write modern React and the ArcGIS API? Uh, historically, it's been a little tricky uh, only because the API was deployed as an AMD build. Um, there were some workarounds you could use to get everything to work correctly. Uh, we have a, a Webpack plugin. If you were not using Create React App, that you could use that Webpack plugin to get everything to work. But that's no longer the case today. So when you're working with React, the big question always is how do I manage global state, right? And part of React's appeal is the fact that this is a very flexible part of your application design 
that you can tweak with. Uh, it can vary from team to team. React, at the end of the day, is a UI library, but it's a UI library that manages state, right? So it kind of is a state library. So you might not need Redux or MobX when you're working with React. It just kind of depends on what you want to do. React comes with a context API. And the context API is a very powerful API. That's It's actually been there in React for a long time. It was just kind of undocumented and some libraries were using it under the hood, but it's now fully documented, it's been fleshed out, and it's something that you as a developer could take advantage of. So when React introduced hooks, they introduced a use context hook, which basically allowed you to create a context, and now you can go ahead and use a hook for that context, and that context would expose some values and maybe some methods to do things. So the use context hook give you access to those various properties. Uh, you could do something like maybe theme the map, right? So if you either want to have a dark theme or a light theme, that could be stored in a theme context. So you could do something like, you know, get the theme and then decide uh, what the theme property is and then assign a base map for your map based on that theme. That's just kind of one of the things you can do. One key bit, though, I always tell React developers is be sure to modularize your API usage. What you probably should avoid is loading the API directly into your components. You should probably have modules where you isolate API usage. It's easier to debug. It's easier to update and work with inside your React apps. So like I said, keep all the API work separate from your UI, right? And this is a pattern in uh, progressive web apps, separate content from navigation. The business logic for uh, you know, fetching data for a map, of creating the map and everything like that doesn't need to live inside the React components. That should business logic should be taken care of elsewhere, whether you're taking care of that directly in state, uh, custom hooks, or just some kind of modules that you've written up to do all this work. It also makes it much easier to mock and stub the API when you're writing your test. So one of the things that you would I would recommend you do is kind of keep this API usage directly inside of modules separate from the context or your component. That way they could be used in either place. This is very useful, for example, maybe you're starting your application using hooks, but for whatever reason, you need to move to using classes down the road. It would be much easier for you to refactor if you did not write all the API usage directly in the hooks or in the classes, and vice versa. Maybe you're gonna go from classes to hooks as well. In this case here, what I can do is I can use the um, use ref hook to get a reference to an element that React is gonna create, and then take the element reference pass it to another function that's going to go initialize my map. It's going to create my map, my map view, and everything else for me based on that element. So why lazy load the API? There's a few different reasons for this. One of the main ones is uh, so that Webpack can create async bundles, right? Uh, your application uh, usage might be bundle one, and the module you're going to create would end up being bundle two, and then any uh, modules it depends on would end up being bundle three, right? So the, the point here is that you're only gonna load the resources you need when you need them. So for example, when I first start my application, maybe I don't need to show a map right away. There's no point in me loading the JavaScript API up front if I don't need it. So I'm gonna wait until the user does something or the application ends up being in some state that it's gonna need the map, then I'll load the resources needed to do all of the work for the map. This is gonna to lead to faster initial loads for applications and just increased performance. So suspense. It, React has, I should say they've, they've begun to introduce an API called suspense. And what, what Suspense does is it lets you lazy load entire React components. This is very useful in pages, like I said, maybe uh, where during the state of the page, uh, something is going to 
happen and then you need to show new parts of a page or maybe even with routing right so routing kind of handles this on its own but this is another way for you to do it maybe you don't want to load components uh, ahead of time with routing if they're not going to be shown because there could be pages that are never actually even displayed when you're doing your routing so there's no need to load them and we don't need them uh, so what you do here is that suspense has a method called lazy and it has a uh, component you could say called suspense you use that lazy method to do a dynamic import of your component and that dynamic import is going to be asynchronous it's going to be a promise you wrap that inside the suspense component and it will dynamically load that component as needed this is really useful and it's a pretty neat concept they've introduced because it also has like a fallback so while that maybe that component has to do some work maybe like fetch some data and that could take a couple of seconds or so uh, so while that is happening this suspense component can display a fallback like a loading element or something like that and then when it's done it'll display your fully fleshed out component when everything is ready really really useful the issue is it's still not out of beta Right, it's been it was introduced a while ago. Um, uh, at this point, uh, we everyone kind of thought it would be out of beta by now, but it's not. So it's still one of those things that yes, it's very cool. Yes, it's a really neat concept, but you should be using it at your own risk. So I'm gonna go and demo a React application written with the ESM build of a JavaScript API, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Okay, so here I got a demo of a uh, application built with create react app uh, most of it's already set up the idea here is that i have this module here that is just going to use the uh, arcgis geocoder to go ahead and find some coffee shops i won't get into too much detail about how that works but you basically just send it lat long and uh, say that i want 10 uh, results all right, so I'm gonna go and do that fetch here. So it's a very simple shop locator function that's gonna get used by my context up here. And these are the results you see on when the page loads. So when the page first loads, you get this list of coffee shops near that lat long location I've asked for. So I just put in a default location. You could of course uh, use the geolocation API in the browser to use your own location. Uh, it's completely up to you. I just want something quick and dirty. So the idea here being that when I click on one of these locations, I want to display a map here showing my, uh, no, the coffee shop I clicked on, or in this case, a tea house that I clicked on. So let's go ahead and get that working. I've got a use effect hook here that would handle this particular workload. So the idea here being that I'm gonna go ahead and load a map, do something to load that map, and it's gonna uh, happen when the show map state has changed in my reducer here. So I've got a, a reducer that's gonna go ahead and handle that. And if we look at the actual uh, app here, the way that this kind of works is that when I uh, click on one of these items, which is right here, I do an on click, I'm gonna go ahead and dispatch a type show map payload is going to be show map is true uh, i'm going to pass the shop i clicked on right so that's going to be like this tea house here that shop is going to have the location it's going to have the address and then the name of the uh, coffee shop and then the uh, reference to the container where i want to display the map right and that's going to be this map div here now based on whether or not i'm showing the map i'll display the list or i'll display the map I think that's pretty uh, straightforward and fairly simple there. So before I can actually do this context part of loading the map, I need to actually create some stuff here in my module, which is going to handle all the JavaScript API bits, right? So I am loading the map, I'm loading the map view, and I'm graphic it here. So I've already got my symbol set up for displaying a marker on the map. There'll be a little coffee shop icon. Uh, I've created a map right here, so it's going to have the streets navigation vector uh, base map. And I've got the scale and then a default center. I just want to show the compass, the zoom, and the attribution widgets. So that's what the UI components is going to do. I don't want any. Uh, I, I, I could just leave it as nothing and then add the compass manually after. 
but I'm going to go ahead, I can uh, use a shortcut here to go ahead and say that I want to display the compass as well. And you'll see what that looks like when we're done here. So then I'm going to go ahead and have my map view and then initialize my map. So this part here is actually done because I create the map view that's going to use the map I created and I pass container. I just set that container to the view and then return it. So this little bit is actually something we could do right now. So if I come over here to the context, I could actually say something like, um, uh, let's see, what was it? Const. Yeah, it's going to be an array. And it's going to await for something. So remember, doing a dynamic import here. And the reason we do this, again, is so that we are only loading the JavaScript API part when we need it. We don't want to have it loaded until it's actually necessary. So I want the initialize method here. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, see here. So I should have a, where's my container? Ah, from the state. I want my container from the state. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that from the state. Not, it's not state in the state. Okay, so grab my container. And while I'm at it, I'll grab the shop. I'm not going to use it just yet. But we'll just grab that. And we're going to initial. We'll, uh, actually, let's do an await. We'll await. Initialize. Not initial state. Initialize. With the container. So up until this point, when I load the page, I haven't loaded anything with the JavaScript API yet. I've just done my quick little uh, search to do um, the geocoding for locations of coffee shops nearby and displaying those results on the page, which is very quick. Very minimal JavaScript being loaded at this point, which is a key to what I want to do for a performant app. So let me go ahead and uh, refresh that real quick. Just get our look. Okay, so now if I click on one of these, I get my map. See, there's the compass I was talking about. There's my zoom buttons here. And the attribution is actually below here. I've got a minimum uh, height set here. So right now what we don't get is we don't have a marker on the page. We need to set that up. And But the uh, at this point... I've just set the container for the map and I have a default center. So now what I need to do is I need to pass the shop to another function that's going to go ahead and center the map and then display the icon for that. So let's go ahead and do that now. So let me look at this here. I have a show location method here where I need to do this work. So that show location method takes an item, which would be the shop, and we're going to pull some stuff from that. So let's go ahead and remove that to-do comment. Let's get the attributes and the location, location, and the extent from the item. So these are all uh, properties that we get back when we do a geocode for um, the coffee shops, right? This comes from the geocode service. So now what I can do is I'm going to create a new graphic. So const graphic is going to be equal to a new graphic and that graphic is going to have some attributes we'll just leave those for whatever we get back it's going to have a geometry and that geometry is going to be a type point the location i get back is actually an xy location and xy is something that could pass to the geometry so we've got that set up I need a symbol, which I've predefined up above to have a little coffee marker. And I'm going to go ahead and provide a pop-up template. But it'll be a very simple pop-up template. It's going to have a title that's going to have the um, place name, which is a property I get back from the geocoding service. And the content is just going to be the uh, place address. And that's the field, or ADDR, uh, is going to be the field I get back from the geocoding service. All right, so there's my graphic. So at this point, I can go ahead and say that view dot graphics dot add graphic. And one other thing I get back from the geocode service is going to be oops, I spelled const strong up here. Fix that. Is going to be the extent for that particular location. So it provides an extent for me that is kind of a a nice extent to zoom for that particular feature. 
So there we go. So we've got that. That that build. Oh, I've got to go ahead and uh, use it over here. So now I can pull one more thing here. I'm going to grab the show location function. And then we're just going to await. We don't actually have to await. We can just do show location for the shop. Okay, so now if I go ahead and click on one of these locations here, there's my map, there's my coffee marker, and it's right on top of the location where that shop is going to be. I can click on this, and I get my uh, pop-up for the name of the shop and the address. I could go one step further here if I wanted to. I could add a button to do directions to that coffee shop from my location. But once again, um, the idea here is to kind of show you how this all works. So let me do a build real quick of this, and this will take a few seconds. So let me build this. Okay, let's take a look at the production build here. I'm going to go and uh, reload the page, empty the cache. And let's look at the JavaScript being loaded here. So altogether, I've loaded uh, 71.8K, roughly 72 kilobytes of JavaScript just to display this first page, which is great because that includes the little module I wrote to hit the geocoder that's returning my results, displaying them and everything, fantastic. That's a very performant page uh, up front, very minimal JavaScript to load. And now if I click on one of these here, and it's gonna go and display the map, you'll see I've loaded 12 more JavaScript files and a total of 636K to display my map, which is great, right? Now, I don't necessarily want to display uh, or actually have all that JavaScript loaded up front. So I don't need to. So what's the point of having it load? So that's why I go ahead and use a module like this uh, web map module I have here that does all the work with the JavaScript API and use the context to go ahead and dynamically import that module so it's deferred until I actually need it. This is kind of the my point when you're building applications with React and this and actually uh, applications with any framework uh, defer loading the JavaScript API until you actually have to do it. Right, and that'll give you very performant uh, applications. And with that, I hand it back to you, Tom. Thanks. Thanks, Renee. As you can see, uh, the ArcGIS Core library is really great for those scenarios where you are that, doing the typical workflow in modern web application development, where you install and import from your dependencies. But you might find this is not always what you want. The ArcGIS API is not your average NPM dependency. It's a, it's a really powerful API. It's a very rich set of capabilities. And that means that it's got a large footprint. So internally, it uses a lot of dynamic module loading and web workers to ensure that your users don't end up uh, having to you know, download more of code than they need at any time than they need it. So this is great for your end users, but can cause some problems for your build tools that can you know, slow things down, or it can you know, be incompatible with like some of the default settings of, of your build tools, you know, out of line with what their expectations are. And this can be a problem if your build tools are what one of these so-called no config build tools like Parcel, or they're doing some, you know, something cutting edge or, or unexpected with dependencies like caching them or that sort of stuff. So for these scenarios, we have another option for you. It's called Esri Loader. Esri Loader is a package that you can install from NPM or you can install it with Yarn. And what it does is it provides you a function called load modules. And load modules takes an array of module names, ArcGIS module names that you want to use. And when they're ready to use, they'll return instances of those of those modules that you can use, just like we've seen, you know, in all the examples up to this point. So if you look at that function signature and if you squint, it might look familiar to you. It, especially if you've used the ArcGIS API in the past, or if you have, you know, looked at our documentation, it looks a lot like a call to the AMD require function. And in fact, this is what it's doing under the hood. Um, but this isn't all load modules is doing. It's also going to lazy load the ArcGIS API for you. Now we've talked about, Renee talked about how important this is for that initial load time of your application, especially if the map is not the first thing your users are going to see, like the demo he showed. Even if it is, lazy loading the API is still a best practice. It helps ensure like your mobile users can have a good experience while the map is loading. 
And so uh, it's it's the default behavior of Esri Loader. It, Esri Loader does it in a different way than uh, Renee showed with the dynamic imports and suspense. Uh, instead, what Lazy Loader is doing is the first time load modules is called, it's going to inject a script tag into the page, and that script tag is going to point by default to the latest version of the, of the uh, AMD build on Esri's CDN. You have options. You can point it to an earlier release if you need it, even 3x if there's for some reason you needed to use that in an application. If your application's in an environment where it doesn't have access to the CDN, um, then you can point it to a local AMD build. And you can also configure lazy, uh, Esri Loader to lazy load the ArcGIS CSS. So all in all, Esri Loader is, you know, syntactic sugar around the using an AMD build of the ArcGIS API. But it's it's more than that. It helps you use the ArcGIS API in modern applications, but it also enables you to keep that API code out of your build, which is going to result in faster build times and greater tool compatibility. And it's that compatibility is a large reason why um, Esri Loader is actually used under the hood in React ArcGIS. Remember that library I showed at the very beginning of this talk the, with the reusable components? Um, Esri Loader, I didn't mention it at the time, but Esri Loader is a peer dependency. So if you're going to install that, you actually end up installing both Esri Loader and React ArcGIS. Um, another library that uses Esri Loader in the same way is called Esri Loader Hooks. And instead of providing you with ready to use React components, this, this library provides you with ready-to-use hooks that you can sort of compose into uh, your own components. So, you know, these are the hooks that are available. And what these hooks are doing is all that work that we step through together, all those best practices like, like using refs and creating the map in an effect and binding up, uh, you know, component properties or uh, event listeners you know, in effects and then using the cleanup functions to undo all of that, just, you know, remove your handlers, destroy the maps. This does that all for you. And it makes it so that you can, um, with just a couple of lines of code, create your own components. For example, if you just wanted to show a web map, all you need is the item ID and the wet use web map hook. And it's going to return a ref that you can use in your component to when you render out the div where you want the map to appear. So it's uh, pretty cool. It, uh, it's a handy little shortcut to get you jump started. Now, in the Esri Lo Loader Hooks repo, we've got a link to uh, an example application that shows you how to use any of these hooks. And we'll take a quick look at that. So here it is. This is the live web page. Here's that web map example. We've got a similar one for web scenes, where also it takes in an ID and returns a ref. If you're not working with web maps or web scenes, we've uh, got you covered with hooks like use map and use scene. So these, instead of taking an ID, are going to take those map and view properties as POJOs, and but they're going to have the same signature where they return an array and the first element is a ref and you can use that ref. If you need to handle user interaction with the map, so for example, we see down here how the text below the map is changing as we uh, move around here, we've got hooks called use event and use watch that um, take in a view, an instance of either a map view or scene view. And where we get this is the is actually the second element of that array that's returned by all the other hooks we've seen so far. We haven't had to use it up until this point, but um, in addition to a ref, all these hooks return a, an instance of the view. And then you can then use that to um, compose your own components with other, with other hooks from this library. So that becomes really powerful. Similarly, we've got one last uh, set of hooks around adding graphics. So they do the same thing. They take, it, take the view, and you can just pass them um, JSON representations or POJO representations of graphics that you want to have added to the map. So. Um, We've seen how Esri Loader is useful if you are creating a library that you want to be used in, in any kind of, uh, with any kind of build tooling. That's probably not the first thing you're going to do after, after this talk. So when would you use Esri Loader? Well, it, it's really helpful, you know, it may not be the tool, you might prefer ArcGIS Core for production applications, but Esri Loader can be helpful for scenarios where, um, you know, the the um, build times are critical, so we're kind of iterating a lot, rapid prototyping, hackathons. 
And it's also uh, a tool that you might use if you just have kind of limited use of the ArcGIS API in your application and you uh, you just don't want to deal with your um, you know any potential problems with the tooling and especially if you're using tooling that's really opinionated or uh, is doing some cutting edge stuff so it's that last category of, of scenarios I kind of want to take one last example to look at I wanted to see what it would be like to add the uh, ArcGIS API to a Gatsby application if you're not familiar with Gatsby, it's an opinionated framework built on top of React. And one of its opinions is that your app, to the extent possible, should be pre-rendered at build time into a static uh, website that you would then uh, just deploy. So, you know, when you run a Gatsby build, it's going to actually, uh, you know, render your application in Node, you know, on your machine and uh, take the, the rendered HTML and save those files to disk, and then when you deploy, you're deploying that the pre-rendered HTML. Now, is this something you could do with um, ArcGIS Core? Maybe, probably. You would just have to be careful to make sure that none of those ArcGIS components are invoked when it's rendering in Node, and there's ways to do this, but it's also one of these things that I just knew I could use Esri Loader, and specifically Esri Loader hooks, and it would just work. So to prove that to myself, I created a uh, little little example app. It's in my GitHub repository. It's called Ezra Gatsby. And the sort of contrived scenario I'm using here is the idea of a contact us page that would be on a, a website that would have a little dynamic map in there and you know show the corporate headquarters and people could zoom in, zoom out. And this could later be expanded to include you know, driving directions. And so that's the premise upon which why you would use the ArcGIS API here. And um, so uh, all I had to do to get this going was scaffold out a brand new Gatsby app using their CLI and then install Esri Loader and Esri Loader hooks as we've seen before. And then um, create an about uh, contact us page and just drop in this map component that takes in the latitude and longitude. So we'll take a quick look at the code for this component. And here it is on GitHub. And Again, um, we're going to be using a map and a graphic. So uh, the first thing I needed to do was import the, the two relevant hooks from Esri Loader, use map and use graphic. This component takes in a latitude and longitude, as we've shown, and um, then uses those to build up a uh, graphic, just some POJOs there, and then also uses the latitude and longitude as the center for the map. And then it ends up calling use map, as we've seen before. And then once we have a reference to the view, we call use graphic to add the graphic to that view. And finally, we render out a div and, and then we show the map at that point. So this you know, was less than 20 lines of code, didn't take long to add this to um, the Gatsby app as I was running the development server. And then when I stopped and ran the Gatsby build was the moment of truth and everything um, worked just as we'd expect. So if you go to the repo here, I've got a link to uh, deploy this under the GitHub pages here. So here is the built Gatsby application. So this is um, pre-rendered, you know, HTML with uh, the interactive JavaScript later, added later. And so we go to that contact us page and the map shows up just as we expected. In conclusion, uh, getting the ArcGIS API into your React app truly is easier than ever. We showed you a couple of libraries you can use with off-the-shelf components and hooks just to get started. When you want to move beyond that and start creating your own custom components or building your own killer React apps with ArcGIS, then uh, we showed you some of the React concepts that you just need to be familiar with, some of the best practices for working with hooks, context, suspense. Um, and we showed you a couple of ways to get the ArcGIS API into your application. I think most people, most devs are going to prefer the familiar import and install workflow that you use with ArcGIS Core. But if for whatever reason that doesn't work for your application, Esri Loader is there for you. On behalf of Renee and myself, I want to thank you for spending time with us today. And we'd really appreciate it if you were able to take just a few more minutes to click on the link below and fill out a short survey and give us some feedback. Hey folks, hey, thanks for watching our uh, building ArcGIS API for JavaScript apps with React. 
So myself, Renee, and Tom are here to cover any uh, questions you might have. Uh, just to note that um, we've learned that after using this platform for a bit is that we are going to mark questions as answered as we go along. Um, unless they have links in them, I'll, I'll leave those uh, just so it's easier for us to get through the questions. So if you see your question disappear after we answer, during we answer it, that's what happened. We mark it answered and it kind of goes away. So um, just so you know that. So we'll just start from the top here. Um, is there a GitHub repo with React samples? So this is one that myself and Tom uh, both put a couple of links into that you can check out. Uh, and actually, the um, we have a, a bunch of samples for various frameworks and tools on GitHub under our Esri JS API resources repo that you can check out. And one of them happens to be uh, how to use it with Create React App. And Tom put up another really good sample of uh, using uh, React with Esri Loader. So you have two good links in there that you can check out uh, to use. Uh, next question in here, if I have a number of values that might change at different times, should I use multiple use state expressions or should I use a single use state expression where state is an object with multiple entries? So this is a good one because I have actually done this before with use state and uh, in context. And I have found that if you're uh, during develop development application, uh, you're building it, your state tends to grow. It can get a bit unwieldy using a use state um, everywhere for this, right? Uh, if you have just a couple of things you're gonna do, that's not a big deal. Uh, in my uh, practice, I have found that I prefer using use state in components for managing the component state. And then for, if I'm using context, I use uh, use reducer in the context because I'm gonna assume I'll pass that context down to multiple components and they can all kind of talk to each other at that point. But I'll use use state for just component level state and not much else after that. So I'm not sure if Tom has any other feelings on that. Uh, maybe Tom? Uh, no, it's, it's uh, I think your strategy sounds, it's, it's just as, um, you know, as sound as any. <laughs> awesome. This next one's for Tom here. All right. Um, sorry, I was uh, trying to reply to another one. The uh, Calcite React repo uh, has been deprecated. And the question is, will it be brought back? Um, what I would say is probably the best thing. I haven't uh, talked to the to the authors of that Calcite React repo recently, but I know they've been talking about deprecating it for a long time. So uh, I believe that Calcite Components um, is the is the library of Stencil Web Components is probably the best bet in terms of an official repo for things that you can use, not just in a React app, but any app. And I'll put the link in there. Awesome. Uh, next one's also for you, Tom. Uh, the testing one, if I'll cover that one. Yeah, so there are a couple of questions about testing and um, what, uh, you know, the um, in terms of the, this was this this question is asking you know what, what uh, library do we recommend using for testing, uh, and, and then there was another question about um, how to test the ArcGIS API code that gets run inside of a componented mount call. And what we what we recommend is that you don't do that. We don't. You shouldn't have to test the uh, the Esri JS API code, we do that. What I recommend doing is, Renee talked about modularizing your use of the API. So you create your own module that exposes a function that will call the JS API methods. And I think in all of your component tests, you should just stub out that function um, and not test it. So test that your component is responding to user interactions and it's calling that function to load the map when it should, but don't test the code that actually loads the map. Typically that's pretty much boilerplate code that comes directly from the A API sample pages, that sort of thing. And um, you, you know, by not having to load the JS API into your tests, uh, it, it'll make them run faster, more reliable, you know, not, instead of having to wait for this asynchronous stuff to, to happen. So that would be my recommendation for both of those questions. Awesome. So the next one's for you too, Tom. Is it bad to set a view as a ref? 
Yeah, so uh, I've done this before. It's a good question. Uh, in the in the talk, I recommended use state. Uh, before that, I was I was doing use ref for views. Uh, it worked out fine. It's actually, I think, uh, a kind of a, a better. Um, in, in many ways, I think it's better. I do worry about having a, a reference to a view in state a little bit, um, but uh, I find it's easier to teach or explain people to use state. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's, you know, the reason it's easier is the syntax is a little more awkward, right? You got to get ref.current and uh, in all the different places. But yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. Awesome. Definitely not bad. <laughs> So the next question here was, is there an Esri focused environment generation command similar to create React app that would show a sample map using React? Um, we do have something right now. So I put a link to that in the re uh, reply to that question, pointing to our ArcGIS CLI. Now it used to uh, provide a React template, but it no longer does that anymore. And we don't do that anymore because uh, it just works so seamlessly with create React app now, um, especially with the 419 release you no longer have to copy the assets folder over. So if you've used 418 and ES modules, um, there was a requirement you had to copy all the static assets over and we showed how to do that. You don't have to do that anymore. We actually, by default, are going to request static assets from our CDN. Um, you can still copy them if you want. It's completely up to you and you might have to if you're in a, a sandboxed environment without any outside network access. Uh, but by default, we'll just use CDN. So they work seamlessly now with pretty much any framework and tooling. So we no longer provide a template for that. And the, the future of the ArcGIS CLI is going to be, it's going to be for the uh, experience builder widgets. It's going to be for um, probably custom widgets for the JavaScript API using our uh, widget framework. Uh, but we might even remove the templates from that in the future and maybe just have repos set up and there's a, a way that you can use NPM directly to uh, install a repo as a template uh, application. So we're still investigating it. Any changes like that won't happen until after the 419 release and probably uh, before or at 420. So we'll keep you, keep you updated with that in the future. Uh, but in the meantime, we do have plenty of sample. Well, we have samples on the JS API resources on using uh, React and uh, the JavaScript API. So you can check that out. Um, next one here was, do you prefer using Esri requests over Axios or Fetch API? So really, realistically, in any application, the reason you'd want to use Esri requests is working with um, ArcGIS-based services, because we take into account uh, any authentication that might need to happen in that case. Or, uh, depending on the server and the service you use, it could be a different error that comes back for authentication needs, and we handle all those different use cases. We even handle IWA, PKI, and different other security models uh, to let you know that you need to have a token or something or credentials uh, provided for a service. And if you're not going to use it strictly with um, you know, ArcGIS services, you're going to call like a third-party service, and there's no reason uh, you can't use Axios or the Fetch API natively to get that done. But um, like I said, as a request, will handle any authentication that needs to happen with the services you're calling. So that's when you'd really want to use it uh, for your projects. And under the hood, we just use the Fetch API uh, anyway in Esri requests. It's just we uh, do, a, there's a lot that happens in Esri requests to make sure that your applications work correctly. So that, I hope that answers that question. Um, next one here is samples with TypeScript and React. I did put a link to a sample in here. And this particular sample actually was something I put together for someone. They were curious about using our custom widgets in a React application. And if you've ever tried it before, especially with TypeScript, um, uh, you have React JSX, but you also have our JSX, which is not based on React. And it, it can be tricky using the two of those in the same application. There's some pragma and some tricks you have to do in the files to make the uh, TypeScript compiler, no, you don't want to use React to build certain files in JSX. So that's what this sample shows, but it just kind of gives you a good idea. Is that really anything special um, using TypeScript with React and the JavaScript API, everything just kind of works. Anyway, there are some things to keep in mind, especially with using like a uh, use ref for divs. Um, you want to make sure a type 
you use ref as an HTML development is the expected element to come back and use that for use ref for anything. If you're using use ref for objects, something like that, type it so it knows what to expect for the uh, ref.current that you're using, right? So hope that answers that particular question. Um, okay, here's another question down here. This was a, this one's not specific to React, but this is we want to allow our users to create custom maps that they can edit. And question is, should we create one account for organization, have many customers creating maps under one name, or have an account for every user? Uh, so if you look at the licensing uh, guidelines, you have to have a one account per user uh, for your organization that's going to be doing any work like that. So. Uh, I'm not going to answer licensing questions, but I can tell you, you definitely want one account per, per user. If you have questions about that, maybe go to the Ask the Experts section and um, ask them about what the licensing details are for that. Uh, so next one here, I think this one is for Tom. Uh, are there any plans to expand Esri, React, ArcGIS, Repo to include more pieces of the JavaScript API? So Tom? And the short answer is no. Um, the uh, that's at this point that 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 um, repository is really just a, a quick way to get you up and running really quickly with React and Esri Loader because it does use Esri Loader in the hood. So uh, and that's why we spent so much time here today and in general trying to teach you guys the patterns for how to create your own components um, because really uh, we found over the years in any context, not just in React but Angular. It doesn't make sense for us to build a whole bunch of component libraries. It's better for you to build purpose-built components on your own. We just want to handle the plumbing under the hood for getting it into the application and the build tools, and then show you the patterns for how to work with those component frameworks. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so this next one is, came up here probably from the, what I was discussing before. Is it necessary to use TypeScript to customize Esri widgets? So our uh, widget framework of using our stuff uh, is TypeScript focused and it has to do with the, our decorators. Uh, you might be able to do it without using TypeScript. However, I'll be honest, I haven't done it without TypeScript. So I don't really know. Um, using the decorators and everything might require a little bit of Babel magic uh, to get everything to work. But if you try it out and give it a shot and it does work, please let me know. That way I can tell others it works. If not, I'll, I'll try and give it a shot at some point down the road. Um, oh man, okay, here's one. What is your in mid production using version 418 with the reissues movement of 419? Um, so far, I haven't seen any really big breaking changes going from 418 to 419. Uh, we do have a repo up on GitHub called under Esri org called, uh, what is it? Feedback JS API Next, I believe, where basically we push a change log uh, every week or so of changes coming to 419 because we have a next release of the API that you can install using uh, at Arcus Core at Next via NPM, and you can get what the next uh, 419 release will be. And we have a change log up there. So you can try that out ahead of time before. 419 comes out to see if there are issues with your app. You can post issues there. That way we can fix them before the release. So that's always available for you. Um, let's see. Oh, the hacker's poster in the background. Uh, so I got this at Half Stack uh, last year as a gift for presenting from the, the crew over there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where that came from. <laughs> uh, okay. Do you have an example of widgets communicating with each other in a React app, for example, using multiple widgets to filter a map and so, so on? Um, that would be more in line with using like the uh, context API that I showed in the sample here and like using some sort of state management. Uh, the cool thing is like the use context is that you can pretty much just pass that around to any other components in your React application and they can all communicate with each other. That The way you do it in React, vanilla React, is the same way you would do it using the JavaScript API. There's nothing different in terms of that, right? Um, and then that, I guess I should cover too. There was another question about using MobX. Should you move to context? You don't have to, no, not at all. If you're using um, MobX or any other state management for React applications right now, there's no rule or anything that says you have to use context uh, API. Uh, in your applications because it's just another tool available to you. It's my preference, but it doesn't mean you have to do it, right? So uh, uh, here's a good one here. Are there any performance benefits using ESM versus Esri Loader? Um, so one good performance benefit for Esri Loader is the fact that your application itself will load up 
pretty fast when it starts up. Um, and then when it's going to defer loading the API to you need it, the same way I kind of talked about. Um, just remember that as your loader is still using Dojo under the hood, it's going to have a whole large Dojo file. And you're just kind of off deferring all of that till later on in the application. Uh, ESM is more of an ergonomics thing, right? You're going to be able to write everything in import statements, uh, write it just like regular uh, ESM ports and stuff. And it's it just makes for a good developer experience to write your apps. And it's built in your application, right? So you can do some good tricks with it. Um, that is it for our question time. If there's anything we weren't able to answer for you, please go to the Ask Our Experts section of the Dev Summit, and you can post your questions up there. Thanks for attending, people. Appreciate it.